And the reality is, is that what we find is, is we find a moment in time to where humanity had got a reboot in a tense. And after that reboot, there was a, a, a long process of wholeness because there was a direct memory of, yeah, so last time when we started having our differences, it led to the entire destruction of our world because we are the world. You know, you don't got to be Michael Jackson to know that. Mm -hmm. So when we destroy ourselves and we have differences amongst each other, then we're going to throw off the balance. That's like, of course, one-on-one spirituality. But it gets a lot deeper because what we find is, is that when we study this knowledge, because I think today we'll get into a little bit about the difference between hermetics versus alchemy. And of course, now those two topics are almost like synonymous with one another. But in history, they actually weren't. And this is, of course, where we kind of would need to do more reading than listening at times because you'll find few people educated about those different levels of knowledge and those different sects, even Gnosticism. Like we actually say these words and we have a generalized uh, determination of what they mean based on what someone told us. But if we went back and we seen Pythagoras, we see Simon the Magus and we see um, Apollonius of Tyana and we see these magicians even of the day or sorcerers of that day then we get a different picture of what we believe, let's say something like Gnosticism is, based on what it's been interpreted to us as now. So what happens, though, is, is that all this is, it becomes very simple because the greatest power that one could ever really possess, and we have to understand that even um, these controlling factions are very well of this, we're very well aware of this, it's balance. And it's interesting because when you understand the definition of balance, it's not good and it's not bad. Bad and good are their own respective poles. Balance is something entirely different that we grow to learn and begin to define as we become more mature. Because obviously one who's just judging all the time doesn't really come into any real knowledge because you know they cut themselves off every time they make a judgment. When they make a judgment, then they're judged. It steers the, the consciousness of the, of the person judging within itself. So the truth is, is that we have to look at something simple that even, and I guess, you know, it's the British's day, but when you have cultures, and this is why a lot of this, the root of it still is spirituality. It's still the, the, the uh, quarrels that were brought about through the different cultural beliefs, even, let's say, in Islam and Hinduism, the difference between these cultures and when these people had to share the same space, in this space, let's say, is uh, united India, then there was a huge breakdown because the Sikhs, the Muslims, and the Hindus couldn't get along from their cultural level. And it began to erode the kingdom. And then at a certain point, you find one who's very w aware of balance. And just let me, let me show you how this works, because we are so naive at times in interpreting everything as, is it good or bad? It's like the flaw in our brain, because it, it always defaults to wanting to put things in one category or another category, good or bad. But what happens is, is that then the British move in, operating under the laws of balance, and say, we're going to be the mediators between all of you. We're going to give you the rule, because think about what balance is. It's actually the, it's, when you look at scales, it's that middle point, that rule, that straight line that now is going to mm -hmm. be there to allow the other two sides to teeter-totter, but still balance them out, themselves out at some point. Yeah, just so sure. you can, Right? So you, so you can then see how something that we would perceive as good, like, okay, once I achieve balance, then I'll ascend. Uh, you, you know, it's like you got to go further in your thinking. Balance is a tool in itself. If someone comes in with it and you have two, three, four, five warring factions and something knows how to come in and, and instill balance through the power, because balance is more powerful than positive or negative or one side or another or differences, then they will rule.
So we see that happen in India and Pakistan. We saw that happen in Mesoamerica with the, the tribes fighting the Aztec, the Tiwo and Tiwo Tiwo Khan and all those different places. We saw in North America, the, the Indian tribes or the Native American tribes going to war with each other, the Blackfoot Indians and the Cherokees. We've seen this in Africa or Akibulan, where you've seen the tribes of the Zulu begin to war with, with the Ashanti. Like you start seeing that when we start having all these differences, and when we're not unified, then we set ourselves up for an external power to come in that's just waiting for us to begin to enact that whole process mm -hmm. of differences so that it can come and then become our ruler. And how this is happening, because this is happening now in the conscious community. So when you study history enough, you can see the new thing, uh, or you can see the new thing being affected by the old thing. Because in the conscious community, because everyone's so divided about and let's see whether we should be vegetarians or whether we should not or whether this guy's really a mason or whether he's really not and maybe he's lying and you know again there's all this gossiping going on this person believes you shouldn't be using names but now you're using names so now they want to take their community away from where you are because you're wrong so then what moves in is a force like baphomet because then that becomes the ruling force that says oh but here's the rules and i'm going to bring this balance and then some people are, are thinking, well, isn't that a good thing? <laughs> See, that's the trick. That's the programming. The mind defaults to say, was well, that good or bad? But time is going to go on and things are going to play out and you're going to see a back and forth volley. So it's not good or bad. What you're going to have is you're going to have a new system that attempts to emerge in acting as the balancing component between people's spirituality and those that are hungry. Because remember, I, I've seen a lot of people that they're still so hungry for this internet fame. They've only bought it into the spiritual arena that when they're really propositioned with the mindset of the same thing that we pledge to get ourselves out of, then they begin to adapt that. If they're told for one moment that, hey, you're the one that's supposed to be in power, they call the Messiah complex then they will adapt the same thing that supposedly years ago that they said that we didn't need to do. So what I'm advising people to do is to start thinking of yourself in a nucleus and what kind of energy you're sending out and what you're doing, because that's where it stops. Like I was thinking about this word gossip today. I said, you know, that's funny because it's like gossiping. Now, I, I try to keep my, my etymology and breakdowns of words really exact because I get people who email me with some wild stuff and I'm like, uh, yes, but no. I mean, we kind of want more structure around what you just, you know, uh, synchronize. But, you know, so this is an example of one. But in every extent, if it's like an analogy to help us remember something, you know, because I do that sometimes when I'm trying to remember something, I'll say, okay, well, this number is associated with like the last two numbers in my, my date of birth. So I'll always remember that number if I'm asked again. So you can associate things with other things to remember them. So gossiping, I call gossiping because what you get is, is you get these invisible forces who are just aware of, who are more aware of who's, who's who and what's what and who's going to be making changes in the future than even those people are. And then they're constantly attempting to cause that confusion between all of those people. And, and it keeps up and it keeps going and it keeps us divided. So that's, that's the beginning of the conversation today is the big question of are we unified? And because we're not, what is that ultimately going to equal for the community at large that is attempting to expand in this realm of spirituality when we're dealing with entities which we call spirits, hello, that are actually invisible to the naked eye, but operate in the person's consciousness. And have we firewalled our consciousness so that way when that urge comes along to call some kind of dissension or to find some kind of difference between one thing and another rather than finding the unifying components or even, you know, really doing the work in, in, in working on bringing the, the connection, you know, like if you find a difference in something that someone believes, and you know it's just completely out of line. <clears throat> I'm sure if you go to that person and say, hey, you know, here's some information that I found and here's my own experience with what you're talking about and I find it to be a little bit different than what you're talking about. That's love. You see what I mean? Like if you're going mm -hmm. to talk to somebody and you're gonna, you really wanna help them, not you wanna make them feel 
that someone that you're more powerful than them. I always get people telling me, well, I know a person who has more experience than you. This is still like my dad can beat your dad, you know, and, and, and that kind of aspect of looking at this because it's not about who's greater and who's smaller. It's about whether we're going to make it out yeah. <laughs> because all of the, the playing, you know, all the back and forth volleying going on, it's gotten nowhere. It's been five years now. If we were set out to do what we said we're going to do, we would start seeing major changes now, not awakening people to information of things that they can do nothing about. I can't do anything about a flat earth. You see what I mean? I can change my consciousness. I can change where I'm at in that whole aspect of things, where I'm at in my being. But I, I can't do anything about the military industrial complex. You see what I mean? Like if I want to go down there and march and tell them they need to shut that down. You see what I mean? Or if I do, I probably will spend my whole life trying to do just that, maybe to get one base closed down. And at the end of the day, five more will pop up. So we have to ask ourselves, are we really working at the level that we should be working? Are we beating our heads against the physical reality, because that's what they call a materialist. Even a person who's looking to manifest some kind of spiritual phenomena into the physical reality was known in the times of the, the let's say, the, the greats, the Therians, as a materialist, because you're still looking to make something happen and manifest within the physical world, which even a lot of people get into the astrology, they get into sorcery, they get into magic, they get into manifestations to make things happen in the physical world. And again, there's nothing right, nothing wrong about this. This is the easiest way to be balanced. There's nothing right, nothing wrong about it. I'm just observing the whole phenomena. But the truth is, how do we progress beyond the physical plane? Because that's where we're going. <laughs> like if we have to like research what we're supposed to be doing next than it would be when we're entering into that non-physical, that non-corporeal. What are the mechanics and what are we going to be encountering there? And is, any, is there any hints here that give us more of an idea of what that may be? And of course the answer is yes. So what I got here is, you know, it depends on if there's any more questions. I really wanted to run over really briefly. And this is going to be a bit rough. It's going to be like a rough draft. But you remember, I got to try this out on somebody, meaning that it's got to come out and then it's going to get smoother and smoother as it keeps coming out. It's core truths, but it's so difficult to get your arms around, you know, trying to translate it. Let's just see what happens. I can't say it's going to be a bad translation now, but I'm giving a disclaimer that, you know, I got to explain something that is a little bit more difficult to explain than the last thing, <laughs> if that's possible. And, uh, and that's just, of course, you know, if we're ready to go into that, because I think that at this point, we're really going to need to get on the same page about history and her story, right? Because there's something that we start to begin to realize right away, and it's that when you start studying the past, and it's, there's a lot of manipulation that goes on just between the two components of the male and the female, mm -hmm. because there's always an agenda to make one seem to be worse than the other. There's the judging. And in the observation, what you start to find is, is that let, if we just put, put, label, put uh, polar, polarity labels on it, a female would be a plus and a minus, and a male would, let's say, be a minus and a plus. But both of them would contain both aspects of what we would perceive as male and female. But the issue is, if we perceive female as negative and male as positive, as the Indo-European cultures did when they usurped the matriarchal societies, then we get into this whole weird conundrum because we start to interpret people, live human beings, in the aspect in which they're not cast in. They're not just negative and they're not just positive. They both contain both poles. And in fact, the only ones which we'll find are the ancient ancestors that truly were able to embody that positive negative pole without showing a gender difference in the physical realities were the first ones also known as the androgynins. That when you look at the cultures in every secret society, 
and you understand how to interpret those words that are being mentioned in the history that's even on the walls, what they're attempting to explain is that the androgenin, you can even say a, a 10, a one and a zero, a being that has a one and a zero, actually became what was known as the lost word. That's why I say in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. So they're saying that the word is actually a being. So when they say the word is lost, that means that somehow these beings no longer come back into the physical reality as much. Now you don't see any real androgenins coming out. And this is because there's an imbalance going on within our own system. Because just from a chemical level alone, the androgen would contain an equal balance of all those chemicals. When a person comes out as male or comes out as female, for what we call male and female, then they're exhibiting a slight imbalance. It's like why we use our left hand or why we use our right hand. Some people are more partial to one, one partial to the other. There's an imbalance. So it was already known that the original balance was actually achieved within one specific being. And this comes off in Judaism as the Cadman. It comes off in Hinduism as Adonari. It comes off in, uh, in uh, Hermeticism as Her Hermes, the hermaphrodite. It comes off in Venusian knowledge as Aphrodite. It, see, it's in all of these cultures that the first physical perfect form is androgynous, not a male or not a female. But what we also have to pay attention to is just what we're dealing with now with this advent of celestial energy. Well, it's not even an advent. It didn't just start. It's always been going on, but it definitely seems like it's intensifying because we're getting closer and closer and because we're breaking down the wall between the realm of the living and the realm of the dead. The actual confusion that we have about what goes on in afterlife, even with us, we're starting to chip that down and start to realize more about reincarnation. And, you know, we're plugging at it. We may not be completely exact, but we're at least now starting to realize that there's something going on beyond this. And so... What this brings us to then is it brings us to a point where we realize that these systems like planets work in cycles. So if the big argument is what came first, the chicken or the egg, because that's actually what it starts boiling down to in, after a while in the first start of, thought of your consciousness, what you have that came first is an androgen. And in its coming into physical reality, it still can be perceived more as a female because it has a womb. And that's how we started to associate the first androgenin with being primarily female, but also containing a male component, having the ability to generate on its own, which they call parthogenic or parthogenesis. So... What we also witness with this, because this is, this is the major key point to everything that you're ever going to see in occultism, everything you're going to see in movies, everything you're going to see everywhere, is this hidden war that's going on because that initial androgynous being containing a womb was also vying for its position when it began to produce more life, meaning as more physical life forms came out, you had these male or female polarized entities coming out. And when we pull away all the money and all the distractions and all these different things that are put in front of us now as being valuable, when you're talking, now you're ancient now, now you're up there, there's writing on the wall, you know, hieroglyphs, there's big pyramids, there's, you know, fo folks floating around, there's vimanas, there's dorje rods. When you put yourself back in that setting, the only thing that's really of power is having the ability to continuously come into these realms. And that's actually what even the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the Egyptian Book of the Dead really entail, is actually how to maintain a body in the, spirit, in the physical reality forever. That's why there was so much time and attention in putting put into the embalming process and keeping the body preserved. So that way, when the spirit left for that moment, it could return back to that body and reanimate that body. Mm -hmm. So the only other way then beyond that to get back into the physical reality was to come through the woman's womb. And so that also was sig significant to the power, that there was power in that womb. Mm -hmm. So this is why later on, you start to see, and Jung talks about this, 
the, especially the Indo-European patriarchal mindset become extremely threatened by this womb because to them, it's the key to getting in and out of physical realities. It's the key to immortality. And because the male doesn't have one, then an agenda launch for the male to actually get one. And this is what you start seeing in science. Actually, it goes as long, as old as Akhenaten. It's even older than that. But the process of it's, it, it's, it's embodied within the Church of Christ today, where Christ is the male, but the church is the female. The wound in the side of Christ is really his vagina. One is to suckle from the wound to sustain themselves. And, you know, you see in the literature, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of James, you begin to see in the literature the actual, even statements like, if a woman is to enter into the kingdom, she must first become a male. You start seeing the stuff that they moved away because they were like, you know, if we show them the, the true art of sorcery, because that's what this stuff starts getting into, then they're going to know we're sorcerers. So we just want to keep some of these watered down books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we want to get rid of Thomas. We want to get rid of James. We want to get rid, rid of the, apoc the apocryphon. We want to get rid of these books because it reveals the identity of what we're doing, how we're going to basically replace Mary. And that's why... Every Mary in the Bible is actually speaking of the same person. There's not Mary Magdalene and the Mary the whore and the Mary this. They're, they're giving you the aspects, all the aspects of what they perceive about the divine feminine. And in this, even in the text, as it says, they're going to attempt to make Mary male and then allow Jesus to surround Mary and become the new kingdom. And then Mary would just exist within that kingdom. And sure enough, just as we see in Christianity, Mary is not the centralized figure. Jesus is. But even deeper than that, you know that this is happening because, in, especially in the cabals, because, <laughs> that's funny, every time you see a male take on a position of power in the world, they always have to take on the feminine attributes. They must put on the dress. If for a yeah. judge, it's the robe. Yeah. For the masons mm -hmm. to apron, right? And then they must put on the wig. That's parliament. And if you really start looking at it, it's like a long list of things that they do in order to take on or actually try to usurp the role of the divine feminine. And it's because the first systems of knowledge, which is the knowledge of Mayat, that was ever on the planet was about the planet, the cosmos. It, it was mainly about the planet, the moon, and the sun, just what you can see, like the little stars, that, that was like extracurricular knowledge. That was when you really graduated and you could actually project yourself to figure out what was going on. The largest celestial bodies were the primary bodies studied. And so through that knowledge, through the knowledge of Mayat, which is alchemy, alchemy means the blackness. Al means the, Kimi means black, the study of blackness. It's why we get chemistry, mystery. All these words all say the same thing, the study of blackness, because it's a knowledge that's purveying everything that we come from that womb. We come from that darkness into light. So if we need to try to understand anything, then we need to study darkness. We need to study chemistry. We need to study mysteries. And when we come into English with that, though, and this is where we got to realize the play, <laughs> Medunetter has 2,000 letters. English has 26, in a, in a hidden 26. So if you're trying to explain attainments of the higher realms, you need a language that you can read up, down, left, right, up, down, left, right, right to left, and uh, down and up, which hieroglyphs you can. And each way you read it renders you the explanation based on the direction in which your consciousness is going. So if you're going in the logical direction, whatever you're reading is going to give you the logical definition of that. If you read it from bottom to top, you're going to get the ascension or futuristic version of what you're reading. So this allows you to make sure that you don't come into any misunderstandings. And it also allows you to read something in balance versus, and many people don't know that, versus in English, you're going one direction, which is the logical side of the mind and also the way of death. The way we read English, look, Write a word and notice you read it from left to right. Now look at the clock and notice you watch time move from left to right. Now then ask yourself, if it's 19 or excuse me, 2016 now, 
But for someone who was living 3,000 years ago, were they counting time down? <laughs> like, that's how they put it, right? Like, d during Julius Caesar's time and, you know, around those times, they were counting time down. They were like 500, 499, 498, 490, right? So what, just in that alone, what does that do for your consciousness? Instead of counting up like I'm getting older, you're counting down like I'm getting younger. Yeah. Huh. And then on top, on top of that, right, what are we counting down to? Because, you know, if you're just in there and you're like, hey, guys, uh, what are we counting down to, guys? Because what's going to happen at zero, yeah. right? So, but what did they tell us happened at zero? That's the difference between a, uh, AD and BC, right? Yeah. But surely we can't believe that it's just narrowed down to this mythological Christ myth, which is actually more of a title than it is actually a person. But it does give us a hint to what's actually happening, that Julius Caesar and Jesus Christ and even John Carter, if you watch the movie for that matter, is actually codes for the process of this idea that the masculine is actually going to take over the world. The king, the masculine king, which you can't say it's a divine masculine. So this is, this is the other thing. I don't want to skip over things here, but let me, let me just put a, a quick note here. You have to realize that when I also identify that everyone has a positive and negative inside of them, you can say that, that one is the divine feminine and one is the undivine feminine. One is the divine masculine and the other one's the undivine masculine. Now, every person has within themselves that distorted, ignorant side that needs, you need to bring light to. So some people in history have become the total embodiment of that ignorant, dark side and have chose to exist and live just as that. So these are very important points because we start realizing that many individuals come off balance quite some time ago and begin to utilize this knowledge that was coming from Alexandria. Really, it came out of Kemet. And if you remember, Kemet in, in, in Egypt is not too far away. Alexandria is a hop, skip, and jump. And what you see take place is that all of the people who are the founders of the secret societies that have dwelt for thousands of years, the sorcerers mainly, which are the names you should remember, Pythagoras, Apollonius of Tyana, Simon Magus, and a few other people that I'm going to end up mentioning during this conversation. But these are cults of sorcerers that are taking the knowledge of Mayat, the Divine Mother, and then conscruing it into their hermaphroditic religion of inversion, which now comes out as Baphomet. It's, I guess it's a goat. See, the thing is, is that some people try to interpret the symbol and explain the symbol as balance and explain the symbol as having all these deep hidden meanings. But it, that may be true. But there's no way, and excuse my French, that a goat with titties is going to come across to a neophyte as anything that they're going to be able to gain a lot of knowledge from. They're going to be so conscrewed because of the imagery itself, <laughs> they're not going to be able to bring forth any positive thoughts. They're going to think that all this mystery and all these traditions have to do with something that is evil. And that's what I meant to, to bring up when I was talking about the language. See, in English, our word for negative and evil and even dark all seem to run together. And this is the part of our problem. Yeah. Right? Because negative is also the same thing on the battery when we have to have two poles, right? Yeah. And then darkness is something that happens at night, but it's not necessarily a bad thing either. But now evil, evil is a distortion and a retardation that comes about because of a defunct language. So that sounds like more of what we're talking about when we at times can conscrew the word negative for evil. So we have to, in this conversation at least, remember when I'm saying darkness because then I'm just talking about the other component to light mm -hmm. versus when I'm talking about evil, which is what's brought about through the ignorance and the distortion of languages and thought processes right. and all of the activities that go on that one may engage in that corrupts them. Yeah. Okay? And so a, that, that's a good thing yeah. to bring up or to, to get clear on. Yeah, there, there, there's another word that uh, absolutely fits uh, with with our stuff here, and that's uh, the the sha words, the the shadow and the shaman, which you know the she man, the shadow. Uh, it's definitely the dark aspect. Um, you know, if you if you look where shaman comes from, 
was uh, I think uh, uh, a Dutch younger guy that, that went to you know today Russia up there Siberia and he saw those uh, women do their magic you know and it, it, uh, they mm. must have had a pact with the devil you know it was a 18 year Dutch Christian guy that wants to learn about language you know got scared and ran back and called them the shamans you know supposedly but uh, um, there's more to it but uh, uh, yeah those words the, the shadow side of it is that we all have them all, always with us Exactly. And then the other thing is, is that we can never get under the impression that studying any of this stuff that we call spirituality is just going to be all butterflies, unicorns and rainbows, which happens. You know, we've gotten to a point where we feel like that if we're studying this knowledge and we, we found the right knowledge, then it's actually supposed to accompany something that's very fluffy and lovely. And that's that's you know, that's our own interpretation. What this is really getting into is it's getting into the operations and the mechanics of how worlds are built and how spirits are trans that what they call the transmigration of souls the balancing of the world or actually in this case the transmigration of spirits the you can't even have an identity for what's called the soul because it's nameless it doesn't fit into any conformity and that's actually what is allowing us to keep going and have this perpetual existence because nobody has figured it out because just like I was saying before uh, about it's just like the male who has this, you know, this woman he meets and he's totally enamored by her. But the more that he learns about her and the more time that he spends with her and the more that he gets from her, the moment that he thinks that he has her figured out, then he becomes disenchanted. And now he wants to go and find something else that stirs that whole thing up for him again. And that's an instinct. We need to think about this. We do this all the time. We do it with even other objects, toys, electronics, different, our job. At first, it's like, man, this is going to get me somewhere. And then, you know, four weeks later, it's like, oh, my goodness, I need to find another job. So what happened? One became disenchanted. So the thing is, you can never become disenchanted by the soul. And thus, it can never be identified. It, those two run hand in hand. That's why when they try to find this whole God particle and all that, it still drives them nuts because they can't. They have all the other particles. They have different things that attract and repel. These are sorcerers. They're hermetics. So hermetics studies alchemy, but more from the aspect of poisons and different things that are actually going to, to, uh, to take away or subdue an individual. And, it, and it very, it's very clear. The difference between a sorcerer versus someone like, let's say, a medicine woman is one is in service to the people. The medicine woman spends all of her time giving these medicines and making these herbs and things to heal. The sorcerer wants to be served. So all these kings then, and this is what people need to realize, all these kings, all these presidents are sorcerers. I don't care how strong their craft is or how weak their craft is, they still fall under that definition because they want someone to serve them. And that becomes a simple manipulation of energy on the astral plane to where the person's energy, rather than recycling with their higher self, which has basically left them here as a seed to grow up and continues to resonate as a connection until they do so, is being interrupted by something who wants to siphon and funnel that energy into itself. So we should be very clear about that. And then the other thing that we ought, should, also should know is during the divine feminine cycles, everything is about pleasure and abundance. I'll say it again. During the divine feminine cycles, everything is about pleasure and abundance. Because if you're on earth and the divine feminine cycle is in its climax, there's so much fruit, trees, singing, songs, dancing, mm -hmm. curves, waving, vibrations, and happiness, and all of what you can embody the divine feminine as, because I think every male is familiar with the divine feminine. So all of those embodiments are what's really in play. So when you get these distorted masculine cycles, now it's scarcity. Now it's money. Now it's a challenge. Now it's all of those things that we dislike the most which is what's happening to our world now. So for me, it's not about jumping on one side or another. I'm just an observer. I'm, I can't jump on sides anymore. I already know that game. But 
I don't want to live in a world that lives on scarcity because I see what it does to the organisms that live in it. And it's sad. You start to watch just, you know, I don't even got to explain it, but you start to watch that back and forth and that grinding go on and the spite and the hatred. Now, remember also that what this causes, because I'm not saying that there's not a distorted feminine, which is the Lilithian force of the Lilith. And that comes out more, though, and it's entertained. Like even, uh, you know, the, the horrible, I, didn't, I couldn't even watch but a couple minutes of it, but Beyonce put out a documentary called Lemonade that pretty much, if you ever had questions that she, if she, were they were in the cult or not, you definitely know now. <laughs> and also in that, you see that their affiliation is with voodoo. And you also see that voodoo surrounds itself by a negative, dark queen who is the embodiment of a woman when she is abused by the divine, or excuse me, the undivine and distorted masculine. Yeah. So I think everyone's run into a woman who's gotten out of a very bad relationship and the man was at fault and she was doing everything that she could and then watched what she turned into after that. So because all these energies are very real, even for that woman, that energy starts to appeal to her, that distorted feminine. See, they're no good. See, they're trying to take everything away. But also remember that the goal here is not to go from one side to the other. The goal is just to remember before any of these cycles started, there was an androgen. It wasn't a male and it wasn't a, just a female. It was both. So the back and forth volley that we're dealing with now between the masculine and the feminine forces are being regulated, arbitrated, if you may, by these so-called powers that be. So as long as they can keep us in confusion about the exact identity of these primal forces, then we will forever believe that, oh, well, yeah, that's right. We need to overthrow this we need to overthrow this distorted masculine uh cycle so that we can get back to the divine feminine that's not what i said what i said was is we need to get divine feminine and divine masculine in harmony and only then will we really enjoy our stay on the physical planes and when one starts to come into realizing that then they work and they toil night and day in the field to bring that balance about and that's actually what I'm engaged in. I'm engaged in unifying the field, not saying that, oh, well, it was better during this time or it was better during that time. And I wish it could be back like that again. It's really about, well, what are we going to do with this now? And what we find is, is that also this is so easy to do and it tends to we do it naturally. We're naturally harmonic, just like a rainbow naturally appears up there. Nobody's got to do anything to show you all the spectrum of the rainbow. And in fact, let's desist for one brief moment to talk about what the rainbow really is and how you get all the symbolism and even all the text that's necessary as far as occult text about what the rainbow is. Because it's first stated by the God of the Bible, who, com who clearly is part of this nefarious agenda, that let the rainbow be a sign of my covenant, okay? So when we move that out of the mouth of the one who wants to try to steal all the power all the time, what we get said is that the rainbow is a sign of the agreement, okay? So what agreement are we talking about? And sure enough, if we keep digging or even meditating, we'll find that every single aspect of the body mainly the primary organs and the primary fluids, the primary uh, glands, mm. they all move in a certain number sequence. But they are drastically different from one another. But what they've done is, is they've somehow come into a synergy, which in, by definition means it's no longer what it was before, but it has become a collaboration of everything involved is, that was involved in order to create something better. So there's a synergy in that that takes place in order to create something that's greater. So what the rainbow is, is the, rain, the rainbow is a sign of those colors which cover the entire spectrum coming together to become something greater. So this is the first thing. And watch, we'll, we'll show with the word, the rain, with the symbol of the rainbow, we find the truth. Now also, when there's a transition between one color and another color, it doesn't just start. 
there's a fusion of those two colors that go on like, the, like a monitor. It's got millions of these fusions of colors and different shades of purple until it finally transcends into the next color. Those are the marriages. Those are the blending that goes on in order to create a bridge between one absolute, I'm red, and another absolute, I'm orange. Mm -hmm. And then we get this fusion of colors. So when we play that out in the physical realm, because as above, so below, what we find is, well, what is the whole purpose of this agreement? And this is what one just says when they're in the meditation about this whole thing. Well, what is the purpose of this agreement? It's to build a bridge. And sure enough, we find that the same design of the rainbow is actually the same design that most bridges are built in. Yeah. And it's for a reason. And they even call it Rainbow Bridge. But what are we talking about? A bridge to what? Well, it's a bridge from the world of the living to the world of the hereafter, which we need to stop calling the realm of the dead. And when that rainbow bridge is broken, now there's no connection between those two worlds. And that's also in the Norse mythology about them breaking the bridge, right? Mm -hmm. So then when you go on, what you find out is, is that we were responsible for keeping the connection between us and our ancestors. Now, I used to get confused about this, especially when I started. I was throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But to understand and connect with one's asset ancestors is no different than you inter connecting with your great grandma. And if you're not into doing that, it's because you've been brainwashed. If you won't take care of your parents when they're dead, if you won't go and visit your grandma when she's old, it's because you're out of balance. You're not even like what all of us used to be because we knew what, what are we doing? We're making this connection between the realm of the living and the realm of the hereafter. So that way we can have immortality, true immortality, which is actually being conscious of your living. See, immortality is guaranteed for every being, but the definition of immortality actually means that you're conscious through the entire process. So that got a little confusing for me in the meditation. So I asked for a deeper explanation. And it says, okay, well, let's erase it all right now. And then let's just talk about your memories. Now, your memory. If you don't have memory, what do you have? Well, first of all, if I didn't have a memory, I would have never remembered to get on the phone today. I actually would have never remembered to get on the computer. Actually, what is a computer? Actually, who am I? <laughs> you see, it all is nothing without memory. Memories are the only power. Yeah. You see, this is where we start drilling into it. Like, this is what I have to say to everyone today. Like, I don't care how long I'm going to be here. As long as I can get this across, then everything is already in the works for the benefit of humanity. Understand that your memory is your power. Because here's one advantage of having memory of your ancestors. You'll know not what to do again. Yeah. <laughs> see, the ancestors beat their heads against the process uh, the process of going through physical realities and what to do and what not to do in order to maintain the balance, which is that rainbow. And they learned that we all need to work together. And there could even be marriages between what we would think is two opposing forces, yellow and or, 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 or red and blue. And then comes this synergy of even greater beauty. So we're having a great time. But if we break those connections, if we allow our differences, see, the differences is why I'm yellow and you're orange. But when someone says, well, everything should be yellow, it's like the movie The Giver. You start to see that that kind of consciousness is actually more malevolent than any kind of consciousness. Because what it produces is it produces one who can make actions and not even feel like there's anything wrong with what they're doing. Case in point, when the when the Muslims wanted to exterminate the Hindus, they did it in the worst ways, cutting people open, bellies, mothers, raping, the whole nine. But somehow that felt okay because, after all, these people were different and they weren't like them. So that gave them the feeling inside that they could do that. That's what happens when we start to disrespect the differences. Now, remember, I'm not talking about evil. Because I see, I found my 
my message constantly being disturbed by evil attempting to assert that, yes, that also means evil too. We must come into balance with evil. No, 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 no. Evil, evil, you're in your own distorted world. You're not darkness. You're not the deep, dark purple. You're not blue, black. You see what I mean? That's, you're something else. You're the distortion and the confusion that comes across when the bridge is broke. And that's why they explain to you again now when we go back to the occult lore that Yad Baal, which is definitely, a, it's called a, a, te, a tetra, it's called a tetragrammatis, a chimera. What it means is, is that in the attempt to formulate this male womb that I was telling you about, that there came forth a creation from this male womb, male aspect first, and that is the God of the Bible. That is the one that is in the whole, I mean, it's obviously anti-feminine in the Bible if you didn't check it. And in fact, when you really get the real books, it talks about circumcision is actually not just to cut the foreskin. Circumcision is to cut the entire penis. And then the man is to be made an Enoch, meaning that he's no longer to engage with women. Same thing with the Knights Templar. In their oaths of monkhood, and in most oaths of monkhood, by the way, you are never to engage with a woman again. The Knights Templar even went one more step. You couldn't kiss your mother or your sister. So what we're seeing is clearly what I'm explaining, that something is back there attempting to sever the two forces. Woman is then seen as negative and corruptible. Man is then seen as some type of uh, even space being from the lights and the sun god. You see what I mean? And then they got us over here believing in all this stuff and destroying ourselves through our beliefs. If there was anything truly right about it, I wouldn't even be on the phone today. I would be having a great time in our balanced world with our bridge. And then I would be connecting to my ancestors for thousands of years ago and not acting like I'm totally disassociated with them. I would know my history and I would know what all these herbs do and I would have a communication with them rather than looking at them on the shelf all dehydrated. You see, so I know where the greater world is. I know what the better world is. No one has to convince me of that. I can't be convinced edgewise either. So what I'm saying is when we get true knowledge and true adepthood, it starts to reveal this to us through us. It starts to show us the same way we act now and the same things that we believe. This is the root to it. The root is because for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, there's been an agenda to enslave our every being through us being divided. Because in that, we can't have power. You're talking about a phenomenal cosmic power being split into so many different parts that none of those parts have an effect. It's almost like a person who's very powerful but trying to do too much. Hello, I'm one of them. I have so many responsibilities. My power is in speech. My power is in writing. I find myself trying to figure out who slipped a worm into the site and now is crashing. I find myself trying to figure out, you know, what kind of uh, camera that's needed that's going to stay on for more than 30 minutes. I find myself trying to figure out how we're going to generate more capital just to keep alive what we spent six years building. You see? So this is why one can then realize, because there's no power in division. And until people start coming together, then you don't have blue where red should be and yellow where pink should be. Everyone is at their stations and what they enjoy. And in the event, and this is what true, let's say we'll use the word magic today is, in the event that you're ready to make a transfer, then you already know what the diametric opposition of what you need to blend with in order to cause that transfer. Meaning, if you decide, well, now I want to go experience X, it's in the herb. There's an herb for it. There's a color for it. There's a crystal for it. There's a time of day for it. There's so many correspondences to whatever you're attempting to achieve, then it means that you're truly limitless. That's what this was. So don't let also these people convince you that Earth has always been a prison system. It wasn't built and designed that way. Yeah. What happened was the greed and the jealousy and the envy of the differences 
See, because in the ancient culture, what they attempt to teach you first is how you're unique and how everything is created unique to have a unique divine purpose, but all comes from the same source. That's one that's rites of passage 101. You have to know what your uniqueness is, because when you find your uniqueness, that method in which you use to find it allows you to also teach others how to find their uniqueness. Now, notice you're not trying to teach them how to be like you. <laughs> you just missed the you flunked the course. After all, everything is unique. You're attempting to show them the, the, the core path, which is works for everyone, of how to understand your uniqueness. And then also you are instilling within them that, but we all come from the same source. We have this unique divine purpose. Now, it, of course, reminds you then of even how the Mayan societies were, won, were run with them knowing what your purpose was, like what you were good at. And they put you into that faculty and that capacity you know, blue snake lightning, you know, he's good at climbing trees and, and bringing in these fruits and then also generating energy of this special kind of force. You see, so each person has their unique ID. And this is each person then, because now we have to get real, real with this. Each person then being in themselves a part of the chain that is expanding across the abyss that is allowing us not to fall in it. See, right now we're falling in the abyss. Our bridge is broken. So the uniqueness that made us all great is now actually becoming our Achilles heel the more that we're taught that we should all be the same way. You see? So this is, this is really important pointers today because it gives some demarcations between, like I said, what is true uniqueness? What is evil versus darkness? What are these different components? Because if we don't know these and we take it for granted, then we're led astray. And there is enough of these entities, because remember what you're dealing with, and I'll rewind for one moment here. What you're dealing with in the Egyptian book of the dead is actually the instructions on how to maintain immortal on the physical plane. That's what the book was written for. And these people are not playing. We play they don't play. This wasn't just fanciful for them. They figured out something. So why do you think it was so important, the Rosetta Stone, for the controllers that we're dealing with today? Because they didn't know what those prayers said. So they didn't know the method or the formula or the ingredient or the recipe to immortality. Now that they know it, they emulate that all the time. They take the pyramids, they got the stuff down at the Louvre, you know, all in their secret society. They got all Anubis there. They got the entire Egyptian Book of the Dead consistently on display that no one understands except for those who crack the script to know what the script means. Mm -hmm. And so thus, they're deifying themselves. That's what they were counting down to. Well, we're going to, because this, this God that they're worshiping, which if you ever really understand this stuff, or if you ever even have the opportunity to speak with someone who is a sorcerer, they're very clear about this. Their God lives in the realm of Nod. Their God lives in the realm of the dead. Because if you look in the text, because Cain becomes the embodiment for the androgynin. That's why you always, the male androgynin, that one in a male womb that I was explaining earlier, that's code name Cain. Cain goes to the land of Nod. That's known as the astral plane or the realm of the dead or the realm of those that sleep. And the reason why it's called as such is because few, only the greatest adepts, can stay in the astral plane indefinitely. And even then, it breeds a certain level of madness. Why? Because it's not stable. See, the whole reason for us to ha be on Earth and why Earth is often associated with a tree and with roots and you need roots, you need ground, is because you cannot just flow off into the abyss indefinitely and expect to maintain any kind of memories. You can't anchor yourself. So they say that their God went into that realm and is maddened by that realm. So any time that, that God is bought into this realm or evoked into this realm on those specific holidays, it comes ravaging, pillaging, and all distorted and just maniacal. Every, there's even words. The words that mean the most craziest things are actually the words that come from the name of that entity. So we have to realize then that 
what we're dealing with is we're dealing with, see this word, soter, S-O-T-E-R. This is the word that was originally used for when we said savior, because we have to stop trying to sync English words back 2,000 years ago. It, you know, you can keep it in the Greek perspective, but you can't cross it over into things like uh, coiniform and into uh, uh, metuneter. And it's because that's where they cut everyone off from the knowledge. They removed the heretic and demotic scripts, which are the scripts. Okay, I got to go back a little bit. So what happens is, is that the rise of this masculine distorted empire starts with Samaria. And it's because that's why the Sumerians are like the, the epitome of the matriarchal civilization empire, right? They even tell you that in, in history books. Oh, they started the first civilization. Now, everyone knows if you're wild, the last thing you hate, the last thing you want to do is be civil. And then you see in the Sumerian paintings them messing with the tree. That's the tree of life. That's the genetics. And you also see them with taming these beasts. Those are the aspects of the zodiacs, also known as the archons, that are the root to the organ systems and things of the physical bodies of all beings of flesh. So what you're witnessing, though, is because uh, Tons Bruns, he proves this without a doubt. And that's why his books are like $150, right? He's got two books, and it's called uh, uh, Egypt, uh, Ge Geometrica Egyptica, I believe, The Geometry of Egypt. And what he goes on to explain is basically the Sumerians hated the, the Kemetans. And what they did was they hated them so much that they didn't want to use their language, so they created this language called coiniform. And this coiniform language, which is set up on a, uh, on a grid of eight by eight. Now, we've heard of that grid before. That's I Ching, and that's the chessboard. That this grid was actually what they began to construct this language, this new language that they began to develop, which was wedges. These wedges also are synonymous with how to bore into your spirit. That's why they're holding that pine cone up against a tree because they're using wedges in that specific design, which is a concave triangle with a point, to burrow into realities or into consciousness. But that may be too deep. So just to keep it on the surface, all the language is doing is recording how many slaves they have, how many kings, the king's power, it records all of most of what we find in the matriarchal tradition of the Bible, the flood story, Gilgamesh. We find every single person, Upnefishtim, Noah. So it shows you that the patriarchal cult actually starts in Samaria because the Sumerians were envious of the Kemetans and the knowledge of Ma'at and the great mother earth, blah, 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 blah. So they create the tradition. They kill Tiamat. Marduk kills Tiamat. So you're seeing the embodiment of the entire story that I'm explaining to you right now between two people, Sumerians and Kemetans. And those two groups today make up the opposite ends of that rainbow. And it seems like to me, though, because I'm not trying to demonize the Sumerians, because to say they were all evil is like saying that all the Kemetans were good. What is, has to happen is the same thing that Dynamo Jack had said. you got to learn how to bring these forces together. And it seems like to me that these two forces, just from an aspect of studying history, are the embodiment of the logical and the spiritual. Because without those two components, one can go headlong into error. Meaning that even if you, if you don't have that check and balance system and you're going with the flow, you're probably going to end up in a short period of time in the hands of some evil person. Meaning that you're like, okay, oh yeah, brother, whatever you want to do. Oh yeah, let's say that. Let's sing that. Oh, okay, yeah, let's go there. Okay, let's pray to this. Oh, that's what you want me to do? So if you're just with the flow, which is also a symbol of the divine feminine, if you're just with the flow and you don't have that, wait a minute, but why are we doing this? Which is the symbol of the logical masculine, like I, I need some instructions and I need to know where that came from. Then you can come off balance. You can put yourself into a situation that you're not prepared for. So now fast forwarding, see how I'm ex I had to explain just the history of the, what was going on with these two back and forth superpowers is the word soder, which is where I left off, meant savior, okay? So any character like what we call Jesus was known as a soder. But the interesting thing is when you really study this word, because it also means to deliver, the deliverance, safety, preservation, this is a soder. 
But the identity of a soldier was always a demon, the spirit demon of a cult. Like basically what it's saying is any tradition that came forth always had a focal point, something that they were trying to point everyone to. In Christianity, it's Jesus. In Islam, it's uh, Muhammad. In Buddhism, it's Buddha. In every tradition, there is something that they try to point you to to concentrate all your power. Yeah. And that becomes known as a daemon. And that word does not necessarily mean something positive or something negative, just something you should observe. And because it gets life, because we give it life, that's why even in certain texts and scriptures it says, you gave me life. It says even that God breathed breath into other forms. Who's God if it isn't man <laughs> and woman? We can breathe life into other things. It's even deeper than eidolons, which are like when we think about things really heavy and then an energetic form is created. This is different. This is devotion. This is worship. This is praise. This is honor. This is what they call the sevenfold spirit. The sevenfold spirit is all the things of the greatest character that you can emit from yourself to another. And that's why they call it a devotee. Because when you give all of those essences, which seem to also correspond with your seven organs, correspond with the seven fluids and melatonin, serotonin, etc. When you give all of that into something else, it becomes animate because you've given it life, God. So this is what's happening. So then, so the big play is, is that we push our power into something else. It becomes more powerful while we become weaker. And then the more power we push into that, the less power and connection we have with ourselves, which, are, which is our ancestral lineage. And then the less p power we have to give to our ancestors, this is like some people always spend more time in these church and these temples than they ever spend at grandma's house, than they ever spend with granddad, ever. Yeah. Even with their own children, they spend more time in the church and praying and on their knees than they spend with their children. And it's because their power is being drained and diverted. But notice how, because I know you two are on to this, so, but notice how all of this is done without the slightest bit of realization that this is what's going on. Likewise, here's another deeper thing that we mentioned during the last conversation, but we can't neglect to mention it during this one. And it's that, so remember, this cult that we're talking about, which makes up these soders or daemons, it's a wand or torch that keeps being passed from one person to another. And this could be Constantine the Great, this could be the immortal Charlemagne, this could be uh, Alexander the Great, and generally whoever it is has the great behind their name and they generally want to be served. This could be Jesus, the King of Kings, it could be any king or any lord, generally anyone who wants to take upon that title. Because in the ancient setting, if you were to become the leader of the tribe, first of all, generally there wasn't a leader. What there was were there was elders. <laughs> and you can't actually put elders in the same category as leaders because we see leaders as like the guy who's triumphing with the sword and gonna, you know the king and just all the ideology that they give us today versus the role of what we would call leader back in the times the elders was to give you knowledge and wisdom was to nourish you in times of trouble you don't see that in these kings today never do you see when you're stranded or on, in bad luck any of these folks showing up to talk to you about anything yeah no so they can't be defined as actual elders. They're surrogates. They're sorcerers. They've usurped the power of most cultures and put themselves into that position, right? So we find that there's quite a few of them, but they all adhere to this one archetypical structure. It's a top-down structure like a pyramid. And when we start to identify them more, and I have to take a break here for just a quick moment. I wanted to take a break at the top hour. But then we start to really unmask what's kind of like behind all of these religions. And I'll, I'll bring up this topic before we take a quick break. And this topic really is, is that we now need to look into just one specific scenario about selling a spirit. Okay. Because you can never sell the soul. We don't even, you don't have a name. You know, if it hasn't, doesn't have a name, then it hasn't been created. So from that level alone, what exists within all of us can never be pinned down or sold or someone can take it or whatever. Now, somebody can fool you and make you believe that such things could happen, which is a whole different matter. But in truth, the soul cannot be even put into a bottle, can't be identified, okay? But you can sell your spirit, it turns out. 
And people need to be aware of this because many people are selling their spirits and they just need to cancel those contracts and get their spirit back. Because this happens when they go out and they delve into these different kind of belief systems and these occult structures. And, you know, they, they do things that bind themselves into it more like the rituals and the beliefs and the baptism. All this stuff is designed to tie them in more just to create memories and reference points to where the person feels like they can't get out of that structure. So and generally, the more people are involved in it, then you have the hundredth monkey syndrome working against us. OK, because we always talk about this hundredth monkey syndrome in consciousness that one day that all of a sudden consciousness is going to start sweeping the land and then we're going to have this hundredth monkey syndrome. Right. Hmm. But what if if ignorance is sweeping the land and we get a hundredth monkey syndrome in ignorance? Mm -hmm. Isn't that just is viable to happen? Yes, it's hundred monkey syndrome is not just exclusive to good things happening, but for a mind that only thinks good it is. And that's why we have to keep our minds in balance so we can get the other side of the story.